I was asked to give a short overview of the data transfer situation. And unfortunately, I can't be there because I have to be in Brussels at the same time. So I'm just going to do um, the presentation there that I hope you all can see now. Um, is that working with the presentation? Yeah, now I see it. Perfect. Um, so basically, a quick recap just for people that are not fully aware of the long, long history of this case. I just listened in a little bit on the previous speaker. Um, it's quite amazing because this case took 10 years so far, um, took us um, three sets of litigation we had to issue against the Irish DPC costing up to 10 million euros in, in legal fees, roughly. I luckily won, so I didn't have to pay for it. Um, but it's not that easy usually to um, enforce these things in reality. And that is something we realized there. Um, a quick recap. Um, so we basically had the American side of US uh, surveillance and the American law on all of this. Um, and I'm just going to talk about the US side first a bit, and then about the European side to see where the clash actually happens. Um, so we kind of saw the whole um, Snowden surveillance situation. Uh, we had all the demonstrations back then. It's more than 10 years ago by now. Um, from then, that time, we knew um, that there is two types of surveillance under US law. Uh, one thing is called upstream, which is the collection of the backbone of the internet or from the backbone, where they can still get certain information, but the more stuff got encrypted, the less you can actually kind of get right out of the cables. So the idea was to use what they now what they call PRISM, which is now called downstream, um, where the data is captured directly from US um, providers. Um, as you can see from the slide, all of that is um, more than 10 years old. Um, so we can expect that a lot of that has grown a lot, is probably much more sophisticated 10 years later than it is right now. Um, and I think that's important to know. We do know the law, we do know the Snowden slides from back then, but there may be a vast bigger amount of surveillance that happens today or a, mass, more, a much more educated way of, of doing surveillance than today. Um, and that is something just to be aware of. Um, if you go to US law, you basically, and I'm simplifying this a lot, uh, you basically need two elements under the relevant US surveillance law. The one thing that you need is an electronic communication service provider, uh, which is kind of any cloud provider in the US. And that is a very broad definition um, and includes a lot of the kind of like cloud IT uh, telecom providers that, that we all know. The other thing you need is foreign intelligence information. Um, which is also very broad terminology um, and is anything that is relevant for the foreign conduct of the United States. Um, for example, there's a couple of other elements of the definition, um, and that is extremely broad. What is interesting is you do not need a crime. You do not need a probable cause. You don't need um, someone that is a suspect. You basically just need information. So it's very different than typical wiretapping where um, you usually have a, a case, something, a criminal offense, then someone that is a suspect, someone where there's probable cause, um, someone where you can actually have approval. You don't need any of that in the system. Now, there is kind of a classified element to the US law. Um, parts of that sometimes gets declassified. So we do have a bit of an idea how that works. And basically what they say is that there is judicial approval. So there's a FISA court that does a certification, but not for the individual surveillance, but for the whole surveillance system for a whole year. So they just say, okay, prison for one year is fine or upstream for one year is fine, um, but not really um, like review the individual case where there's surveillance. And that certification is mainly there to do minimization and targeting procedures. And that is very crucial because this type of surveillance would be um, unconstitutional in the US under the Fourth Amendment if it would be done on US persons. And what the whole law does is that it basically splits the data from Americans to, to non-Americans. And on one side of the game, they say, OK, you can't touch it because that would be unconstitutional. And the other part, they say, is all fine because um, foreigners don't have constitutional rights. So we're all good and we are ready to go. And then there is a directive that goes to individual service provider that basically tells them to open up an API to pull the data. In my case, uh, we had the situation where I'm that little Austrian smiley. I had a contract with Facebook Ireland. Facebook Ireland then forwarded the data to the US and the data was basically captured at least twice with upstream and prison under FISA or 12333, which is this executive order in the US that also allows surveillance. And then there's a limitation in PPD 28. I'm gonna get to that in a second. Um, now, that was the American side. What does the EU say? 
The EU basically has an export prohibition on personal data ever since 1995, and we can only transfer data abroad if it's kind of necessary. So Article 49 necessary is probably a bit of a simplification here, uh, but it's probably useful for people to, to think of it that way. Um, that also means that basically for outsourcing, there is only the option to do one of these transfer in instruments that we now have, and they all in various ways expand the GDPR rules to, to other countries. Um, adequacy kind of says, okay, the other country already has a law, and in the situation as on the slide here where the other country simply has a vacuum, we try to um, expand, um, expand European law um, via a contractual instrument. So we basically have a foreign um, company having a contract with a European company saying, oh, I'm going to follow kind of like European privacy law. Now that works um, if you expand it and, and if you have a contractual arrangement like that. So at the Court of Justice, we also supported, um, for example, the use of SECs, which uh, for example, the DPC said you couldn't use, which I never fully understood. Um, but the problem is that in the US specifically, there's not just a vacuum of, um, of surveillance laws. Um, there is an actual surveillance law that says the opposite. So we're now in a situation where EU, EU law requires that there's privacy and US laws requires that there's surveillance. And as a company, you're just going to be somehow violating one or the other law. And once you operate in both, uh, both jurisdictions. And I think that slide is the crucial element of this whole litigation is we simply have a conflict of law situation. We have two different sets of jurisdictions that have two different sets of laws that just conflict each other. And unless we're going to move back one of the laws, there's basically going to be that conflict for, for the time being. Now, what's the current situation after the Court of Justice basically decided on this? Uh, we do have this uh, proportionality test usually at the Court of Justice. Oftentimes, the Court of Justice found EU surveillance already to be disproportionate. For example, um, the um, data retention situation that the Court of Justice has repeatedly said is, is too much. What's interesting in this case is that for two times, the Court of Justice found a violation of the essence of a fundamental right, which goes even further and basically says that um, you don't even have to do a proportionality test because what the US does is so extreme that um, the American view is, uh, that the European view is you don't even have to kind of go into proportionality there. Um, that basically leaves us with a situation where we have this essential equivalence with the GDPR. Uh, we kind of have to overcome that hurdle if you transfer data abroad. But then you also have to check for fundamental rights in the other country and check kind of if the Charter of Fundamental Rights would be complied with if you transfer. Um, and that is a very complicated assessment. Um, being aware that many people are not happy that they have to do this assessment, what was interesting is when the GDPR was negotiated in Brussels, a lot of the companies said that they want to have regulated self-regulation. That was the buzzword. And that is exactly what the transfers are. It basically means that companies have to individually check if they want to tra transfer data abroad, if it's okay and doable. Um, now, when really having to do it, obviously that generates a lot of frustration and, and work. So in very simple terms, what are the practical consequences of the status quo? Um, if you do these transfers and you do outsourcing, you usually have a bit of a problem here. And that basically means if you have necessary transfers, you're probably good. If you book a flight in the US or you have to send an email, stuff like that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, there was a lot of like fear mongering when these decisions came out that you know the internet is gonna be down tomorrow. Um, that's not really true. However, if you outsource to one of these FISA companies, one of these electronic communication service providers, you do have a problem because they cannot really comply with, with any of the EU law right now. That's also true if the server is in the EU. So a lot of the Microsofts and Googles and, and Amazon said, oh, no problem, we're just going to put the server into the EU. The problem is as long as they have possession custody control from the US, so as long as the US side can still access the data in the EU, they do fall under this uh, surveillance law called FISA. So that's not really a solution. There are solutions where this possession custody control is kept, where there's no access from the e US anymore. That is something that, for example, Microsoft started to develop a bit. Um, that could be a solution that actually moves stuff forward. Uh, but right now, we still see that just this moving the server to the EU, is tr they try to sell that as a solution, and it's not going to really solve the problem. Now, there is also the situation that you may transfer data to a normal US company that doesn't fall under these surveillance laws. And we don't see any problem there as long as you have your SECs ready and so on. Um, so that is also a situation that I think is, is interesting. 
Now, what you all are probably more interested in is how this whole thing moves forward. Um, what we do see here is that we basically have this future where we have the privacy shield as it is, which is going to run with the same thing a, a third time now, um, but they will slap a EU-US framework on top of it. How did that came about? So um, the lawyers tried to kind of fix the problem for, I think, more than two years then and couldn't really find a solution. And then Biden and von der Leyen got together, had a coffee, and suddenly solved all the problems in an afternoon. Um, and basically put out these three headlines. They said that the privacy shield stays. Um, there's no, not going to be any change there. There's going to be an executive order that introduces proportionate and necessity into U.S. law, which would be really, really interesting. I'm going to get to that in a second. And there's going to be a data protection court in the U.S. I'm going to get to that in a second as well. So that was kind of the three magic bullets that they tried to kind of um, use to get this whole issue done. Now, what is one of these executive orders? You may remember Trump signing these wonderful pieces of paper with a big Sharpie, um, and that is an executive order. It is an internal order within the executive telling pe people in the government to do something or not to do something. Now, that is not a law that's important. A law um, gives you third party rights. So it's a bit like um, if you have a legal right externally or if your boss just orders you to do something or not to do something. If your boss orders you, you have to do it, but your client, for example, cannot sue you over it. And that is what an executive order is, bottom line. Now, they use executive orders more and more in the U.S. because they are unable to pass their laws in, in, in the Congress. So they try to kind of maneuver more and more with these executive orders. Um, now, this new executive order is presented as wonderful and having all these protections and being great. Um, the problem is that there used to be an um, executive order called BP28 that was already there since the Obama times. And if you put them side by side, um, you realize that there is not much news in, in the new executive order. It's pretty much a copy of the old PPD-28 that they now try to sell as new and as, as more protections. And PPD-28 was already at the Court of Justice. So the Court of Justice has already taken into account a lot of these elements. Now, the new executive order does have a couple of additional elements, um, some good, some bad as well. There is, for example, partly even more surveillance possible right now under the executive order. Um, but there is generally, I would say, a bit of a better protection, but it's not mind-blowingly bigger or, or, or different than what we had before. Um, so we late, largely have the same limitations as in the old PBD-28. There are some additional reasons for mass surveillance. So, for example, health and climate change is now a reason to have mass surveillance as well, um, which probably came out of uh, the COVID pandemic and the general discussion about climate change. And what was interesting is that um, the necessity element was already in the old executive order as well in PPD-28. Um, and the commission back then has already said, oh, that's the same thing as Article 52 of the Charter. Now they say it's necessary and proportionate, which is now equivalent to 52. So you see they added this one word. Um, but the assumption is still the same on the European side that that would be good enough and, and would require it would be equivalent to the European test. Now. That is, to me, the most mind-blowing thing of this new idea is that they now say that there's going to be proportionality in U.S. law. Now, the Court of Justice has already found that Pfizer surveillance in prison is a violation of the essence of your fundamental right, or at least disproportionate. Um, and it's very hard to see how you can suddenly write into an American executive order that surveillance has to be proportionate, while also maintaining that you're not going to change the surveillance. So if they would put proportionality into US law as, as we understand it, they would actually have to move back a lot of that surveillance and, and drastically limit it. They don't want to do that. They already said they're not going to do that. Um, so the magic trick that we did here is that there is now a US version of proportionality where just the parameter got shifted so much to the other side that they can still say, oh, we use the same word. It's both proportionality but we actually disagree on the meaning of that word. So that's the next level of political fuckery in, in this whole system. Um, and that is kind of what the Court of Justice will have to adjudicate, I guess, the next time around, if using the same word, but just giving it a different meaning is enough protection for European data if you don't change the underlying practices. Um, the other thing is that instead of the ombudsperson that we had before, we now have a CLPO. Um, and the idea there is to replace the person that existed with a new person in a different department. 
um, you still have to bring your case through the um, data protection authority. Um, and you would still get exactly the same answer as with the old um, ombudsperson. And the answer will always be that, first of all, they neither confirm nor deny that there was any surveillance. So you don't know if there was any surveillance at all. Secondly, they either complied with the law or thirdly, they have not complied with the law, um, but remedied the situation. And you're not going to be told which one of the three is, is your situation. So if there is no surveillance, you get that answer. If there was a breach of the law, you get that answer. If there was no breach of the law, but there was surveillance, you get that answer. Um, it's a total rubber stamp. You can basically just um, copy paste it. One person on Twitter put it really nicely saying it's a situation where you kind of know the judgment before you even brought the case. Um, now, if you're unhappy about that, and because that's only an executive dude that's in there, um, the new system will also have a court, quote unquote. Now, the court is exactly the same system. Um, you can just write appeal on this first answer you got. Um, then there's going to be a number of people doing the same process a second time around, and you will get literally exactly the same judgment a second time around. Because both of these decisions are pre-described in the executive order. They basically have to take exactly that wording and send that back to you. Now, if that is um, a judicial review or a judicial process under Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, I have my doubts. <laughs> and you have to think that the Court of Justice will have to look at this system and compare it, for example, to the discussions we have with Poland and Hungary about their judicial system, where we find violations of Article 47. Um, and that's going to be very hard for the Court of Justice to say, oh, that's fine, but you know what Poland and Hungary does is, is not good enough. Um, so just um, as a thinking process of, of what the Court of Justice will likely have to do here. We even at the office got like a rubber stamp where you can just stamp your um, decision already now because we kind of know what the answer is going to be. So if you're interested, we usually have that around at conferences as well so that everybody can, can get their answer stamped right away without having to go through that process. Um, now, one thing that's interesting is the new executive order only applies to data that was transferred after the coming into force of this new agreement. So we don't really know what happened with the data that was transferred before. Um, right now, as the law is, you would have to retransfer all the data. So you would have to bring it back to Europe, then basically transfer it again to fall under the new executive order. I have no clue who got that wonderful idea, but you would have to have basically a US, EU, and back to the US system to even fall under this new system. One short um, mention is that also the commercial data usage under the privacy shield is going to not be uh, um, essentially equivalent with the GDPR. So for example, you don't need a legal basis like consent, but you can basically just process any data with opt out. Um, and that is something where we see um, a fundamental problem as well um, that the Court of Justice could take to invalidate this. Now, um, they tell you you should basically um, answer on a positive note. Uh, when we'll, I, I will try that. Um, the EU US privacy shield is going to be around. We're going to have this new um, system slapped on top. It will go back to the Court of Justice. We kind of think that um, we can probably challenge it within weeks after passing, which is going to be very different than the tedious procedure we had in Ireland, where it took, uh, I think, four years. We're probably going to be able to get that through Austria or Germany or so rather quickly back to the Court of Justice. We then um, expect the Court of Justice to um, have about one and a half years for the decision, but there is the option that the Court of Justice could already put a stay on the application of the New Deal if it takes the view that this is just a ping pong that is like pointless. Um, but for the time being, we're going to have that ping pong. Now, um, the um, I'm just going to quickly run over that uh, run over that part um, on the long term solution. Um, I think what's going to be interesting is. In a positive thinking, we would need some kind of no spy agreement among democratic countries where we would have like common sets of rules on what surveillance is, is OK or not, independent of citizenship. Because right now, even within Europe, if my data goes from Austria to Germany, I don't have really that much protection against the German secret services. And having a global Internet where every data goes around, it kind of makes sense to also have global protections, at least again, among democratic countries where that may be realistic. The problem here is um, that right now the US is not really um, up for that. Um, the second option would be to just have a couple of judges in, Ireland, in, in the US that actually make these decisions. So putting 20 judges in the US saying yes or no on individual surveillance would probably be the most cost efficient way of dealing with the situation as it is. 
for the time being, I think what a lot of people will do more is have this EU segregation with an EU entity where the data is held. That data could still be held by a subsidiary if you make sure that the subsidiary cannot um, forward the data to the US, which is doable in certain uh, legal instruments. Um, thanks a lot. I hope that was useful for your discussion. And um, I hope that your conference goes on well. And if there's any questions, um, we may be able to also Yes. Do that remotely. Thanks, Max, a lot. It was insightful. Uh.